Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name, if this is your first time here, is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension in Hernando County, Florida. And normally I'm <coughs> here with my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who wasn't able to make it again today. She wasn't here last week also. Please don't think that we're having a fight or an argument or anything. She was on vacation last week up north. And today she's tied up with a couple things. And next week I won't be here, but she will be because I'm tied up with a couple of things. But hopefully she'll be back really soon. And I, a lot of times I'll have a special guest on here with me also. But today, just like last week, you guys just get me. So if you have any lawn and garden questions, please go ahead and put them in the uh, chat box. And I'll be able to read them and share them and hopefully answer them depending on what the question is. But for anybody who lives in Central Florida and for Buddy who lives up there in the Panhandle, it was cold again this morning. Oh my gosh, I walked outside and my car was covered with ice and I had to run the defrosters for five or 10 minutes before I could take off and the cold weather is still with us right now. So I still see so many people on Facebook, and we're still getting so many phone calls from people all confused about, we had a freeze, and my bushes have dead brown leaves on them. Do I prune them now? Do I prune them tomorrow? Do I prune them next week? Should I prune them last week? What do I do? Guys, it's really simple. We're still, if you're in Central Florida, we're still going to get some more cold weather. And if you're up in North Florida, you're going to get even more cold weather probably than we will here. So you need to wait until after the average last date of the last freeze and frost for your area. For here in Hernando County in Central Florida is generally March 1st to March 15th. And then go out there and prune everything. If you prune it too early, two really bad things could happen. One is that you're going to get another really bad freeze. And you've removed all the brown insulating dead leaves on your plant. And it's not going to be able to insulate your plant. And now when it gets cold again, it may completely kill your plant. Or something else that happens is shortly after you prune any plant, if it rains or you water and the weather's fairly nice and it's supposed to be beautiful today, it was just cold last night, what happens is that plant starts to grow. And it starts to send out new little sprouts and new little branches. And if it does that, and a week or so later, another freeze comes along, it may completely kill your plant. So really simple, don't rush out there to prune things today, wait a bit. And even if you're not sure if your plant, it looks really, really brown, it's like, is it dead? Is it alive? Is it gonna come back? I don't know what's going on. Just be patient, wait. You're gonna know within about a month or so whether that plant is gonna start to grow back. You're gonna look for any kind of new growth, new shoots, new leaves down on the stem especially close to the base if you scrape it with your thumbnail and it's green underneath that brown bark it's still alive if you scrape it with your thumbnail and it's brown you scrape a little bit more and it's still brown and you kind of bend it and it snaps it may be completely dead and you may i mean some plants do get lost every winter depending on exactly where you live how far north or how far south you are Good morning, Cindy. How are you? Now, Cindy in Pinellas County is going to be a little bit different. And anybody who lives in South Florida, Broward County, Miami-Dade, wherever, your spring comes earlier than it does here. And our spring comes earlier than it does up in the panhandle for Buddy. So you need to look at the exact date, depending on where you live, when it's safe to prune things. But for most everybody listening today, it's really still too early to rush out there and start pruning everything back for spring. Because I know here in Central Florida, what is this? Today's February 10th, just shy of the middle of February. Oh, yeah, we can get our worst cold weather during February. So may get another devastating freeze. We may not. It may be very, very nice for the rest of February. Nice at the beginning of March. And we're going to go straight into summer by about March 15th. That happens sometimes. But as a general rule, to be safe, you're going to want to wait a little bit longer before you rush out there and start pruning 
all the brown stuff and dead branches off your plants. So as always, if anybody has any questions, just go ahead and share them in the uh, chat box, all depending on where you're watching us from. We are supposed to be broadcast on our Facebook page, also our Hernando County uh, Facebook gardening group, and also on my YouTube channel. So no matter where you're watching us from, you should have a comment or a chat box there. And I see we got seven people on Facebook and one on YouTube at the moment. So all of you have a chat box where you can put in questions, comments, where you live. I'm always curious about where our viewers and listeners live. I know that we've had people from out of state before, so you cannot go by my dates because my dates are for Central Florida. I know we've had people from North Georgia, I think, before, Carolinas, uh, somebody from Michigan, I think, in the past. So planting dates in Michigan are totally different from here. But even if you live in a different part of Florida, your dates are going to be somewhat different than what we follow here in Central Florida. So... Let me share a little something that we have coming up for people who live in Hernando County or not too terribly far from Hernando County. We are going to have a class coming up in, let me check my calendar here. The class is scheduled for Tuesday, March 8th at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is a little bit different from usual and it's gonna be on growing pineapples in the home garden. And if you sign up for the class, there's a $20 charge, but you're gonna be able to come by our Master Gardener Nursery that weekend, or the office if you need special arrangements, you can contact me about that. And you're gonna get three small starter pineapple plants. And this is a named variety. It's Florida Special Pineapple. It was, I think, developed by Dole and grown by Dole in South Florida not that many years ago, but it's no longer grown down there in South Florida. Unfortunately, the price of real estate in South Florida has gone through the roof, and they're building a lot of houses down there and growing fewer crops. So I guess pineapples were one of the things that kind of went. You know, they used to grow lemons down there in South Florida also, but not anymore. The lemon grows are all subdivisions now, I guess. But we're going to have a class on growing pineapples. If you sign up, there is a $20 charge for that, but you're going to get three pineapple plants. And I should have information on that either later on today or by tomorrow. If you go to the website that's scrolling down here right below, www.hernandoextension.com, you'll find all the information about that class, where to sign up on Eventbrite, the exact day and time, when to pick up the pineapple plants, and it's something that you may want to think about because, you know, pineapple plants, pineapples are something that maybe a lot of people don't think about, but they can grow very well and very easily here in the home garden. And once again, if you live in South Florida, they're going to grow fantastic because they grow year round down there, except for maybe a few weeks when it gets a little chilly, they kind of stop and don't do a whole lot. Here in Central Florida, they don't do really well in the winter. They can freeze when it gets really, really cold. This variety is cold tolerant, so we're going to explain that during the class. So this variety, once it gets up and growing, is going to take the cold better than some varieties of pineapples. It gets a very, very nice, large, I think it turns a little bit reddish on the outside pineapple right before it's ripe, so don't hold me to that. But um, Nancy, good morning. How are you? And here we got Diana. I don't know where you guys find all these emojis from. I don't have access to that many, but I guess they have one for everything. So with the pineapple emojis there. And Susan, good morning, Susan. How are you? Susan says she has several patches of some kind of native grass doing great even with the freeze. Would I just bring a sample by for an identification? You can bring a sample by our office to get it identified, or if you're able to just take pictures of it and email it to us or send it to us, uh, 
that would work very well also because for a lot of native grasses, what we have to do is send the pictures off to the University of Florida to a service called DDIS. And the pictures go to Mark Frank at the University of Florida Herbarium. And he is the expert at identifying plants. Different grasses are really tough because they all look very, very similar. And there's a lot of times where he could say, this grass is part of this family or this genus or this group but he can't say exactly what species it is because you'll have to see either flowers or seeds from it. And you have to send a sample to him up in Gainesville for him to physically look at, at it to figure it out all the way down to species. So like I said, if you wanna bring a sample by the office, we are more than happy to look at it. We may have to take pictures of it and send it off to get it definitely identified if it's something we're not familiar with, but we could do that for you. And Lee, good morning, how are you? I guess it was probably chilly even down there in Broward County where you live. Not as chilly as it was here. I had ice all over my car this morning and I don't like that. I do not like the cold. Anything really below about 50, I think is really cold and just ain't right here in Florida. 70s are fine, 60s are okay, but 60s and sunny. 36, that's way, way, way too cold. So guys, if you all have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat box there. And if you mark down this website, HernandoExtension.com, every time we have a class planned out and scheduled, whether it's me or Lily, or a lot of them are me and Lily, or anybody else in our office, when we put it on Facebook, it automatically gets fed to this website. So you can go there, even if you're not on Facebook, you don't have a Facebook account, you don't like Facebook, that's fine. This is a freestanding website that's just fed from our Facebook feed. So as soon as we schedule a class, it shows up on the website here. And that way you can get all the information, the day, the time, the link, if there's a charge, if there's registration, all the different details that you might need are all gonna be there. And Lee said it wasn't too bad down there in Broward County. That's good. Um, like I was saying earlier with the um, pineapples in South Florida, pineapples and every kind of tropical fruit grow quickly. They produce well. They have pests and diseases. I mean, don't think that they grow without any kind of problems down there, but they grow very well down there because it's pretty warm year round and they just keep growing all year long. And I can give you a little, little tip or trick with certain tropical fruits that are not annuals, they're not perennials, but they're kind of in between, like a long-lived annual or short-lived perennial. Things like pineapples, bananas, and papayas. If you're trying to grow them, what you want to do is during the warm time of year, you know, here in Central Florida, um, we do have a warm time of year. Down in South Florida, that's pretty much all year long or almost all year long, maybe for a month or two, it's a little chilly. But when they're growing, you wanna make sure they don't dry out, make sure that you provide adequate water, plenty of fertilizer, plenty of compost, and just get them growing quickly and growing like crazy. That gives you the best chance of getting bananas, pineapples, and um, papayas fairly quickly because bananas and pineapples need about 10 months of good growing weather to go from little plant, bigger plant, bigger, more leaves, more leaves, magical number of leaves, and then it makes either bananas or a pineapple, but it needs that 10 months. So you need to really kind of kick them into gear and when it warms up in spring, get them up and going. If it's dry, water them appropriately. If it's raining every day, they love that. They don't mind when it gets hot. They don't mind the humidity. They're gonna grow like crazy. And that's gonna give you your best chance of getting um, pineapples and bananas in a reasonable amount of time. So any other questions that anybody has, please feel free to go ahead and toss them in the chat box there.
And of course, for anybody local, if you need to contact our office, you have any questions, you need a plant identified, uh, you found a bug in your house or a bug on your plants, you don't know what it is, put it in a container and bring it by the office. Here's our phone number. And if you call, you'll normally get a hold of Teresa. She's not here at the moment, but she should be back here pretty soon. So if you call later on today, Teresa or Mary will answer the phone. And if they can't help you out, they'll pass you on to me or whoever can help you out. Normally, the easiest way to get in touch with me is through email. So there's my email. If you have a question, you have pictures. And I always tell people there's no such thing as too many pictures. So if you can attach them to an email or emails, send me a bunch of pictures of whatever your question or problem is. That just makes it a lot easier to identify what the problem is. And we tell people, obviously, try to take good, clear pictures if you can. If it's of something large, like a plant, a tree, a shrub, a bush, take pictures from far away, take it from up close, individual leaves, kind of from as far away as you can and as zoomed in as you can of what the problem is or might be. And then, of course, if it's something that we have to look at, maybe we can't tell from the picture or we could tell like it's an insect, but we can't tell exactly what. We may tell you that you have to get a physical sample to us. We do have microscopes here at our office all day Thursday or really from about nine to four on Thursdays. We have a master gardener here, Bernie, and he's more than happy to take questions and samples. He knows how to use a microscope for little tiny insects and problems. We put it under the microscope and then we're able to see right away what the problem is. Sometimes identifications, very, very easy with those tiny little problems. If you have a microscope, for homeowner, if you guys want to get a microscope also, I own one. Uh, I find it comes in very handy, so I have my own personal microscope at home. But I know not everybody wants to get that extravagant and buy a microscope. So what you probably want to do is buy something that's called a hand lens or a jeweler's loop. That's L-O-U-P-E. And what this is, is like a magnifying glass. And a regular old-fashioned magnifying glass will work just fine also. But a hand lens or a jeweler's loop, and I should have one right here in my desk drawer. I found one that I inherited. And this is a fairly large one here. And if you push the buttons, there's the magnifying glass. And you can look and see and magnify. This is probably somewhere between 10x and 20x. So it's going to magnify things anywhere between 10 times and 20 times. And it has a little um, light in it also. So you can get all kinds of really nice ones online. Let's try looking at what. Amazon has for sale. So if I go to Amazon and I look in, I just look up loop, L-O-U-P-E. Um, go ahead and share that and give you a better idea of what they look like. There we go. So in Amazon, you see um, many of these are 30x. They have some very nice ones. And you see the prices range. Anyway, these right here are $10 up to $30. For just a home garden, you don't have to get anything quite that extravagant. Wow, they have some nice ones here. Um, the little ones that look kind of like a cup or a glass that you set on top. Or something here we go here's the type that we have at the office we bought a bunch of these oh this is the exact one we bought a while back and these are five dollars each but well worth the five dollars comes in a little case it magnifies 30x or 30 times so this is very handy if you're looking at your plants and leaves in your garden 
to figure out exactly what the problem is because a lot of these insect pests are very, very small. And you can tell with the naked eye, there's something going on. There's something on that leaf, but I can't tell exactly what it is. That's where you need something like a magnifying glass, jeweler's loop, or um, microscope to figure out exactly what the problem is. And Lee asks a very good question here. So Lee, down in Broward County, so that's south of here, South Florida, asks, will the cold temperature we had last week destroy the aphids and eggs, if any, on the soil? It depends on exactly how cold it got there. Below a certain point, the cold weather begins to kill insects. But remember that you, there are potentially a huge number of insects left over from last summer that are now hibernating or hiding in leaf litter. Aphids hide in tree bark. A lot of times they'll overwinter in trees, so they hide in tree bark. And they're hunkered down and they're pretty well protected. The colder it gets, the more insects are gonna die. So it, it knocks them back. And then even if it gets even colder, it keep, kills even more insects, but it won't kill all of them. So cold weather and cold winters and cold fronts will reduce the insect pressure for this coming spring. Because I know if we have a winter where we get very, very little or basically no cold weather, insects are really, really bad in the spring. The colder the weather we get, the lower the insects starting off are. How come the only time they ever come by to cut the grass here at the office is when I'm doing something online? Sorry about the uh, background noise. I'm looking out my window at the uh, lawn service riding, doing donuts and 360s all over our front lawn here. But that, co that cold weather will definitely knock back the insect pressure. But insects don't go extinct. Some of them will survive. They'll come back. And by later in the summer, their numbers are going to hit an average level. But a benefit of a cold winter is you have fewer insects starting off in the early spring. So hopefully that answers your question. And we got a question, can I start tomatoes now? Yes, right now for anywhere in Central Florida. I have some started and I need to start some more, so I'm kind of behind. I should have started them potentially weeks ago. I like to start mine the week between New Year, Christmas and New Year's, which is good and early. So this year I'm gonna be late. But yes, you can still start tomatoes from seeds right now in Central Florida. In North Florida, you, go, I'm, you can start them now, but you're going to put them in the garden a little bit later than you would right here. And in South Florida, yeah, you should have already started them, and they should already be up and looking good at this point. And Corey says he has a lens that clips onto his phone so he can take macro pictures I have a set of those lenses also somewhere my wife gave to me, and they're they're really cool. It's really nice. It's something that clips onto the camera on your phone, and it's a little bulky, but you, you just kind of slide the lens over the top of your camera lens, and they work surprisingly well. So there's a lot of different options out there, and you could use that to just look at it through your phone or, even better, take pictures. So now you're able to look at it to identify what it is or take pictures and send them to me to see if I could tell from that exactly what they are. And Lee, wow, Broward County got down to 39 degrees. That's still well above freezing, but that's still pretty chilly. So my guess is that will that'll knock a few back. Um Corey says the last two big freezes got to 19 to 20 degrees at his cold spot. That's cold. 19 to 20 degrees will knock back a lot of the insects that are not really, really well protected. But none of them are going to go extinct. None of them are going to totally disappear. They'll come back this coming spring and summer just a little bit slower than they normally would. And great buddy up there in the panhandle has his tomatoes up and sprouting. That's great. You know, you can start them really, really early. And if you keep them in trays, put them outside when it's sunny and warm, bring them inside when it's going to get cold. You go back and forth and back and forth for a while. 
when they get <clears throat> a little bit larger, you have to put them in bigger and bigger pots. But when the time comes to put them in your garden, if you have nice big tomato plants, that's fine. They make great transplants. So nothing wrong with that. And Facebook user, I'm sorry, if you ever watching us from our Facebook group, it says what I see is Facebook user. It won't give me your name. But later on, when I go back to the Facebook group to check later on, I'll see who it was that asked this. <clears throat> so don't think I'm trying to be disrespectful by calling you Facebook user. That's just what StreamYard and Facebook show me right now. So Facebook user, whoever that might be, is using a magnifier app. Yeah, you can get apps on your phones. You can get um, different little slideable lenses. Lots and lots of options out there now. And you know, a lot of them work surprisingly well. And Buddy says they go from egg cartons to pea pots. I've done the exact same thing. I have the little three inch pots. I have the larger pots. I've even started them early enough where they've been able to go up into one gallon pots before they finally hit the garden. And they were nice and big and starting to flower. So they didn't have to go very far to start producing and give me a really good early crop. So those are all really, really good steps to take with tomatoes. And Facebook user is Nancy. So thank you so much, Facebook user, who I know now is Nancy with those questions. So guys, you all have any other questions here? Um, please feel free to ask. And... Let's see, what else do I have? We have 10 people watching us live now, eight from our Facebook page, I believe, and one from the group, which is always great. Um, do we have any brand new people on here today? I think last week we had two people who said that they were new to the virtual plant clinic, which is always great to hear. So obviously they heard about us somehow from somewhere, I'm not always sure. But yeah, if we have anybody brand new on today, please go ahead and put in the chat box who you are and say, you know, good morning or welcome and where you're coming here from. So that always kind of helps us to figure out where our audience is at. Because like I said before, when I start telling people dates, I uh, wouldn't want Buddy to go out there and start putting tomatoes in the ground March 1st because he may get cold weather up there even after that. And then a lot of times people in South Florida, if they follow our timing here, they're putting things in too late at that point. So for anybody watching us who is new to Florida and maybe you had a vegetable garden in another state or somewhere else, what you don't wanna do is put your tomato plants out in the garden in May and grow them during June and July, expecting tomatoes in August because that's not going to work out really well. It never does in pretty much any part of Florida because that is all way, way, way too late for putting in tomatoes, especially in Central Florida and definitely in South Florida. North Florida, if you live like almost up to the Georgia line, maybe you can get away with it, but probably not because in Florida, we have a totally different gardening calendar here and we are on a totally different time schedule. So Cindy asks, how is Lily enjoying the snow? She made it back from the great white north. I haven't had a chance to ask her how much snow she saw, although she did put pictures on Facebook and I saw snow. So she was in the snow. I don't know if she got stuck in the ice storms that were scheduled to come through that part of Pennsylvania. I don't like those ice storms. I definitely don't like driving in ice storms either. But Lily is back, and she will be here next week. I am going to be off on vacation next week, and I have no idea what I'm doing yet. So if I can pop in next week, I will. Otherwise, I won't. So maybe I'll be here, and maybe I won't be here. But we will definitely have Lily in charge, and I think she's going to come and – um do the plant clinic with Bernie, who is here at our office in our plant clinic, and they'll be here to answer your questions 
and give tips and advice and talk about the cold weather and any other freezes that we've been getting. Robin, good morning, Robin, and welcome. Robin is here from Ormond Beach. So Ormond Beach is, I used to live in Deltona over Volusia County, and Ormond Beach is literally straight across the state from here in Hernandez County, pretty much. So you're very, very close to our latitude. So whatever kind of dates and advice I give for here in Hernando County would apply for you also. Of course, depending on how close you are to the water, that can help a lot during the winter. It's gonna keep you a little bit warmer. People who are further inland get colder. People who have low, you know, good piece of property and high spots and low spots. Low spots get even colder. I think Corey mentioned that he has high spots and low spots. Cold air will settle in the lowest spot in your yard. So a lot of people have little microclimates to worry about. But, yeah, you should do okay in Ormond Beach. You could probably experiment with and try some different tropical fruits. Not too far south of you, Brevard County, they grow a lot of tropical fruits down there successfully. And Corey says with his tomatoes, second week of June, they crashed the last two times I tried. I tell people with tomatoes, you need to plan on putting them in the ground, in the garden, or in containers, however you're choosing to grow them, anywhere from the end of February to the very beginning of March. And by June 15th, which is also about the second week of June, they are done. Plan on tomato plants going away, going bye-bye. You're going to get rid of them. And if you want tomatoes again in the fall, you're going to replant um, fresh seeds or start with fresh plants. Because holding them and trying to keep them alive and going through the whole summer with tomatoes almost never works. The tomatoes will end up with all kinds of diseases and insects and problems. So tomatoes will not work. Peppers work maybe 50% of the time. You'll be able to keep them through the summer. I've had some where they made it almost through the summer, but then die shortly before fall. It happens. Eggplants, sometimes you can keep them going during the summer. They're a little bit more tropical. So depending on how extreme your weather gets, you can try holding them over during the summer. And then what happens in the fall is they're going to perk up when the days get shorter and the weather gets a tiny bit cooler. And they're going to flush out with new growth and hopefully give you a bunch more eggplants. The peppers are going to do the same thing. They're going to flush out, give you a whole bunch more peppers in the fall. But I can't make any guarantees that's going to work. But I can almost guarantee you that tomatoes will not work. And I see on Facebook, some people seem to think that they're going to give them an award for keeping a tomato plant alive for two, three, four, or five years. To the best of my knowledge, nobody gives awards for that. And a tomato plant that is that old, it's not going to produce a whole lot. So what it's giving back to you is very, very little. But what you're probably tempted to invest in it, along with water, is going to be more fertilizer, more insecticides, more fungicides, things like that. And now those different chemicals are in the environment. You're buying them. You're spending money on them. You're spraying them all over your backyard. And for tomatoes, I'm sorry, it's not going to work. Some people are able to hold a few over, but it's very rare and probably not really worth your time, trouble, cost, and investment in money. During the heat of summer, it's better to pull out those tomatoes and plant lots and lots of okra if you like okra. And not everybody does. I do. So Heidi, good morning, Heidi. Heidi's joining us from Cape Coral. Gosh, we have people from all over the state here. Um, oh, Cindy has a good question here. And this is kind of a common one. She misses a lot of the spring bulbs that she had up north, mostly daffodils. Is there a way to grow them down here? <clears throat> yes and no. Things like daffodils, crocus, tulips. If you order the bulbs online and plant them in the fall here, in the spring, with a late, late winter, early spring, whenever that bulb is triggered, 
it's going to sprout, it's going to grow, it's going to come up, and it'll most likely flower. What happens is if you leave it in the ground, which most people, you know, most people leave those things in the ground up north, during the summer, it rains too much, it gets way too hot, it gets way too humid, and those bulbs will rot. So daffodils, tulips, crocuses, and there's a lot of other bulbs that grow up north will crash and die during the summer here because it just gets way too hot for way too long and it doesn't really cool off at night. So even at night, the temperature never gets below 70 for months. That is a big factor in these things not doing well here. You can buy some and plant them as an annual. Now, after they flower, if you dig them up and you have a root cellar or someplace to store them, most of us don't have a root cellar. I don't have one in Florida, and chances are most of you don't have one either. They can be stored and replanted in the fall if you really want to go to the trouble to try doing that. But those spring bowls don't work out well. Like I said, um, what are the ones? Uh, there's a lot of them that you can already buy growing in a pot, and they'll come up. And I think there is a species or variety of Florida daffodil. It gets much smaller flowers than the northern daffodils do. But as a general rule, almost all those bulbs that do really well up north are never going to do very well down here. You can give them a try, but you have to start asking, you know, is it really worth the time and trouble and expense and the chance that, you know, the bulbs that you buy are not going to last for more than one year? Um, you could try growing them in a container, then storing the, cutting them back, storing the container in a cool, dry place for the summer. You could try that. But putting them in your landscape and keeping them there long term, unfortunately, doesn't work out well here in Central Florida. So let's go back to one last time. If anybody's interested in any of our upcoming classes, if you just go to the website that's scrolling on the screen, www.hernandoextension, all one word, .com, and you go there, you're going to see a full listing of all of our upcoming classes. We will have one coming up on pineapples that should be on there by either later on today or tonight or by tomorrow. So please check that out. If you sign up for it, there is a charge for that, $20 per person, but you get a free online class, and I have an expert on pineapples coming in to speak specifically about them, and you get three pineapple plants. But you have to come to us to pick them up. We can't ship them. So for anybody who is in the Panhandle or South Florida or another state, Think about how long of a drive is it to get to Hernando County and keep that in mind before you sign up. So it, it does say in the information there that we are not able to package these things and ship them. So you'll have to come to us. But for local residents, that is a great way to learn about different things, edibles that you can grow in your yard or in your landscape or in your food forest, things that you can grow for yourself and your family. It's going to help to strengthen your food systems, your own personal family food systems, and give you a variety of things that are going to grow well in your yard right here in the local Hernando County area. And you even get a couple plants to start get started with. So after we tell you what to do with them, we'll give you the plants and then you can take it from there. We gave a class on blackberries a few months ago before the holidays. It went really, really well. Everybody got three blackberry plants. We'll do it again sometime. I'm not sure exactly when, but it was a very good variety that's going to do really well in this area and got everybody off to a great start. Everybody really enjoyed the class and they really enjoyed the plants and they all felt that it was a really great bargain also. So, let's see if we have any last minute comments here. Sydney, you're very welcome. And it's tough telling people or giving people the bad news sometimes about things that just are not going to do well in most of Florida. 
those no northern bulbs are one. Lavender is another one that just doesn't do well here. A lot of herbs, all the Mediterranean herbs, grow very well here. And you can grow um, basil. Gosh, basil grows like a weed here. Grows very quickly. You're going to get basil to pick and eat very quickly. Uh, oregano, sage, all those different things grow very well here. They take a beating during the summer. So during the summer, they may start to look really, really bad. But most times they survive the summer and then perk up in the fall and do great. Northern fruits are not going to do well here in Central Florida because they need a lot more cold weather during the winter to trigger them to flower and set fruit and come out with new leaves in the spring. So northern things like all the different apples, pears, they're not going to do well here. Crab apples don't do well here. Cherry trees, like true cherry trees, like you buy at the store during the summer, too hot here. They're not going to do well here. They need much more cold weather than what we have. European wine grapes don't do well here because we have a little insect that gives them a disease called Pierce's disease. So if you try growing Thompson seedless grapes or the red seedless or um chardonnay all the different things you make the european wine with here in florida they will get that disease and they will promptly die muscadine grapes are immune to that disease so muscadine grapes grow great here in florida and are definitely worth a try they have a unique taste not everybody likes them i like them i like them for fresh eating i even like muscadine wine i think it's very good um so a lot of those things that they grow up north are just not going to do well here. You always want to check first before you start spending a lot of money, ordering a lot of things from a uh, catalog, going to a big box store, because unfortunately those big box stores sometimes have them for sale and don't think that because they're selling it and it's in your town, it's going to grow well in your town. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. So you always want to check with extension or look up extension publications on that particular crop first before you go sinking a bunch of money into it. Because unfortunately what we see is people will spend a bunch of money on it, they plant a whole bunch of apple trees, and they say these are low chill apples, and somebody told me they grow great, and now they look terrible. And either I got no apples or I got four apples, and they're like the size of marbles, or crab apples, and we tell them, yeah, they don't do really well here. You know, might not be your best choice. Could have gone with peaches, plums, nectarines. They all do great here. Uh, citrus obviously grows well all over Florida. It has problems, but it grows well here. It's a good choice to try. Pomegranates grow really well here. What else are they looking at? Um, vanilla. Vanilla orchids, you can grow here. They do great in South Florida. You can do them in Central Florida. You can even push it and squeeze them in North Florida. We had a class on that a while back. So there are plenty of things that you can grow here. You just want to do a little uh, homework first and make sure there's a good chance for survival in your yard before you go sinking a bunch of money into it. And Cindy, you're very welcome. You know, a, the reason why a lot of those different plants don't grow well here is summer rains, the soil just gets too wet for too long and the, they rot. It could be summer humidity. That is what damages or kills a lot of plants, especially things that grow in a Mediterranean environment. Because this we're subtropical. We're not Mediterranean here in Central Florida. Totally different. So the humidity in summer can do in a lot of plants. And the reason why a lot of northern things don't do well here is because we don't have cold weather for many, 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 many hours during the winter like you do up in Ohio. Because, for example, you can grow peaches here in Florida. You can grow peaches in Ohio. There's varieties that grow up in Ohio. You can't grow the same varieties, though. The one in Ohio requires about a thousand chill hours or like 
a couple thousand chill hours. I don't know how much they get in Ohio, but it's a couple thousand chill hours during a normal winter. Here in Hernando County, we're lucky to get 350 chill hours. So you have to get a variety that wants and needs about 350 chill hours, and that's enough cold weather. So in the spring, it's going to go, yay, spring is here, it's getting warm. I'm going to make flowers. I'm going to make little fruits. I'm going to send out leaves, and I'm going to be very happy and productive here in Central Florida. So it's not just the type of fruit. You have to get the right variety of fruit. And Corey says, he has wild Calusa grapes that are pretty good. They do have wild Calusa grapes, muscadine grapes. I mean, they go by a lot of different names. Um, some of the wild muscadine grapes, they all flower and get fruit. The female vines do. But some of them just get really, really tiny little fruit, and it's not the kind of thing you really want to eat. Other ones will get fairly large, looks the same as domesticated um, muscadine grapes that you can pick and eat. And if you go out for a lot of hikes out in the forest, you'll encounter them still quite a bit in the forest and woodlands that we still have. They're out there. Um, but even if you grow them on your property, keep in mind if it's a fruit and you're thinking like, I don't know if I want to eat that, I'll probably never get around to picking it and eating it. If you grow it, it's great for wildlife. So the birds, the animals, everybody else out there appreciates the heck out of your fruit, even if it's something that maybe you don't want to pick and eat for yourself. Um, a good example of that is the native plums. Native plums, they flower, they get fruit. Uh, you can make, most people don't eat them fresh. They make jams and preserves. If you add enough sugar, they'll taste really, really good, but it takes a lot of sugar. Other people will grow them and they say, hey, you know, I'm just going to leave the fruit for the animals. So the animals really, really do appreciate it. It will help support more wildlife on your property and wildlife and supporting wildlife is a Florida friendly landscape concept. So when Lily comes back next week, make sure you all tell her I was teaching Florida friendly landscape concepts here. That will make her very, very happy. So, guys, if anybody has a last-minute comment, if you want to squeeze it in there really quick, um, let me see if there's anything else I need to share here. No, I think that pretty much does it. Yeah, and Corey points out that kind of stuff is either wildlife or famine food. Good point. You may be thinking, like, eh, well, if times get really tough, I can eat it but whether you really really want to eat it is a different thing i know people are fascinated and they always come out to incredible edibles the kind of things that you can find out in the woods that you can eat just because you can eat it doesn't mean it's going to taste good and you want to eat it and cindy says thank you for teaching how this is really a fascinating science for years i was one of those who just wanted a plant because i liked it <laughs> well, Cindy, that's fine. I mean, you should like all the plants in your yard. But for everybody, it kind of comes down to where you live. That determines your set of possibilities. Because keep in mind, I got an email from a lady once before, and she said she just moved to Citrus County. And she said, I really want to grow apples. I said, too warm here for that. She said, okay, fine, bananas. I said, gets too cold here in the winter for that. She said, lavender. I said, nope, way, way too far south and too hot for that. She said, well, can you, what, you can't grow anything here? There's plenty you can grow. You just have to have a good idea of what is my set of possibilities. And then look through it and pick out what you want and what you're going to make use of, what you're going to enjoy, what's going to be pretty, what's going to look good. <clears throat> for a vegetable garden, what you're going to eat. Don't grow radishes in the winter if you hate radishes and you're not going to pick them. Unless you have a neighbor or a relative that you're growing them for. <clears throat> Otherwise, you're going to end up with a ton of radishes that you're not going to enjoy. But no matter where you are, there's a ton of things that you can pick from. Just have to do a little homework to figure out what they are and take your selections out of that list. Don't go by what they sell at the local uh, big box store. They don't do a really good job of checking their list first. 
definitely, I mean, and I mean, there's all kinds of really good, reputable companies online with catalogs. But if you order a cherry tree to plant, you know, um, down in Broward County, they'll ship it to you. They'll cash your check, charge your credit card, however you pay them, and they'll ship you a beautiful cherry tree. And you'll plant it, and it will probably promptly die <laughs> because cherries are just not going to do well in Broward County, not at all. So they, but they don't send a little note like, hey, uh, by the way, this isn't going to do really well. We check your zip code or where we're sending it to. They don't do that. So you always want to check with us here on the virtual plant clinic or with your local extension office or look online and get reputable information about what is going to do well where you live and take your possibilities from that list. Monique, thank you so much for tuning in. You're very, very welcome. And, uh, gosh, who is this? Who? Nancy, okay, I'm sorry. Nancy, under Facebook user today, says, yeah, Lowe's sells lavender. <laughs> and I'm sorry, for those people who really, really love lavender, I love picking on it because it's so far away from where they grow it commercially. Commercially, they grow it in, I think, Washington State and Oregon, the eastern side of the mountains. They grow it in Idaho. I know a lot of other western states out there, you can grow it. There is a place, a farm up in the Panhandle somewhere where they grow it commercially. I don't know how well it does. And it's literally spitting distance from Alabama. So it's... It's just about southern Alabama where they are. So that's going to be kind of the northern extreme of Florida. Like I said, I don't even know how well theirs does. But yeah, here in her here in Central Florida, nine to, 99 times out of 100, it's just going to lead to disappointment. So if you try it and if you are successful, take lots of pictures and share that with me so that I can kind of show you as the one successful case but for most people it's just not going to do well and Corey points out yeah there's a lot of people selling true tropical plants to people here uh that you're going to do great down there in south florida not so much here it's it might be worth experimenting with and worth trying but you need to know what you're doing walking into it don't go out there and buy a mango and a uh, lychee tree, and if you live in Spring Hill, plunk them both out in the middle of your front yard and think they're going to take 29-degree weather in the middle of winter, not going to work out really well. You know, you need to know what you're doing before you do that. Lee, thank you so much for tuning in from beautiful South Florida down there. I can't believe it only gets down to 39, and I guess you probably consider that really cold weather down there. Got a little bit colder than that here. So, guys, thank you so much. I think we're going to wrap it up for today. And like I said, we will be back again next Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, Lily will be in the house. She'll be back, and she'll be in charge, and she'll be here to take all your questions and answer them. And if they're really difficult, she will save them, and she will forward them to me. And then I'll get back with you with an answer. But we'll get it figured out one way or another. So, as always, guys, thank you so much for tuning in and so much for participating. We couldn't do it without you and without all your, your questions and everything. And, yes, Joel, this episode is always saved on Facebook or the Facebook group or on YouTube. It's turned into a YouTube video. And they all have closed captioning also. For anybody who's interested in that, YouTube will take anywhere from a couple hours to 24 hours to get the closed captioning in the video. So if you ever try to watch it right after this and there's no closed captioning yet, it's a YouTube thing, just like Facebook has weird Facebook things. So, yeah, you can watch the replay over and over if you really want to listen to me over and over. Otherwise, you can just come back again next week and catch us then. And Cindy, yes, I very much will enjoy my time off. Thank you so much. So with that, guys, 
We'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining us and tuning in. See you then. Bye.